Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the McLean Center, uh, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the Buxbaum Institute, uh, I welcome you to the seventh lecture in our 2016-17 series on reproductive ethics. It's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Paul Bircher, MD, PhD. Um, Dr. Bircher did his fellowship um, with us in the McLean Center in 2014-15. And Dudley, I had the dates a little wrong. Um, uh, Dr. Bircher is now an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Albany Medical College, um, is, is also the program director of the residency there, um, and is the associate director of the Alden March Bioethics Institute uh, at Albany. Um, Professor Bircher received his MD from the University of Arizona College of Medicine and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Oregon. Uh, Paul Bircher's publications have focused on the doctor-patient relationship, physician empathy, and more recently, on ethical issues in clinical obstetrics. He has written to defend home births. In this, in this conference, we've heard some vigorous attacks on home births, um, uh, including a, a recent article by Dr. Bircher entitled, I think I've got this title right, There is no place like home. The limits of institutional change and why home birth remains a rational choice. Uh, currently, uh, Paul is engaged in a research project studying cesarean section regret in an effort to develop strategies to reduce dissatisfaction and regret among women who undergo C-sections. Um, Dr. Bircher is also co-editing a textbook on reproductive ethics that will be published by Springer uh, in April of 2017. Um, Dr. Bircher remains clinically active as a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist uh, and enjoys his work with medical students and residents. He was the recipient of the Association of Professors of Gynecology and Obstetrics Excellence in Teaching Award in 2015, as well as resident teaching awards from Albany in 2014 and 2015. Uh, today, Dr. Bircher is going to talk to us on the following title. Cesarean Delivery on Maternal Request, Did We Let Birth Choice Override Safety? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Bircher. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Siegler, and thank you, Dr. Chor, for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak here. It's wonderful uh, being back in Chicago. I was reminded last night of all the fabulous restaurants here. Um, Albany is good, but it does not rival Chicago. <laughs> So what I'm going to be talking about um, is what uh, the American College of OBGYN refers to as CDMR, which stands for Cesarean Delivery on Maternal Request, or you could also think of it as um, Maternal Choice uh, Cesarean Birth. So I'm going to review uh, essentially the history um, of CDMR in the literature and then um, talk about kind of a changing understanding of the ethics of CDMR. And ACOG in particular uh, shifted its position on CDMR between 2007 and 2013. And I'm going to talk about why that shift may have occurred. Um, and then I'm going to end with uh, a suggestion that perhaps a, a, a medical application of the precautionary principle might be a useful way of framing this discussion about the ethics of CDMR. And um, if I am guilty of OB speak, meaning that I start using uh, you know, abbreviations or uh, medical terminology that I haven't properly defined, please just stop me and I will do that. I, you know, I forget that, that, that uh, not all of you have to live and breathe obstetrics the way I do. 
So, um, as I said, the, the, the term that I'm going to use is CDMR, which, which means an elective cesarean section requested by the pregnant woman. The, that is actually different than, than the term elective cesarean section. A survey of women who were postpartum actually found that the more common cause of an elective cesarean section was a, a physician-initiated elective cesarean section. So uh, a, a woman-initiated is actually less common than physician-initiated. But an elective cesarean section in general means one that, that doesn't have a medical indication. And so an elective cesarean section where the woman makes the request is then CDMR. Okay? Um, we don't have a really great um, hold on how, um, how many CDMR cesarean sections occur. And the reason is, is there's no, I guess it's ICD-9, ICD-10 code. There is no code for, for CDMR. And so the, the ways of sort of getting at what the, the true number is is, 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 is difficult. Most of the literature places the number at somewhere between 2 and 8 percent of cesarean sections, although the NIH actually um, estimated that it was higher than that, and some of the more recent literature ha ha has also sort of intimated that, that, number, that, that even that 8 that 8% number may be too low. I used the 2 to 8% number to say that, there, that, that, that the exact number then would be somewhere between 30 and 100,000 per year. And that's based on the fact that there are 1.3 million cesarean births in America per year. And our overall cesarean section rate in America currently is, is running at just over 32%. The first paper in the literature um, that, that sort of Tra you know, tracing the ancestry of CDMR was an opinion piece in the New England Journal um, published in 1985. There was no, this was not a study, there was no new data. They were work, they were essentially extrapolating from the literature and making the case that, um, that um, elective cesarean sections should be offered to, to women. Here, and here was the, here was their reasoning. We do know, and this is, this is actually uh, pretty solid data, that an elective cesarean section has less mor morbidity and mortality for, for a woman um, than a cesarean section after labor. So uh, a, an indicated C-section where the woman has um, you know, either failure, to, failure of arrest or dilation or descent or for one, any of the medical indications that we normally use for cesarean section. Once a woman has labored, a C-section is actually more dangerous for her than a scheduled elective cesarean section prior to labor. And they argued that if we simply did elective cesarean sections on all women at 39 weeks, one week before their due date, where there's no risk of iatrogenic prematurity for the baby, that we would actually be reducing stillbirths and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, that is, a baby that, that's been damaged by lack of oxygen during birth. Okay, so brain damage to the baby because of lack of oxygen. And that by simply eliminating um, labor between 39 and 42 weeks, we would, be, we would be reducing stillbirths and essentially eliminating hypoxic injuries to newborns. And, and by their math, they, they calculated that, that essentially five to 10 uh, babies' lives would be saved for, for what, they, 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 by their best guess, would have one excess maternal death. So they said, well, you know, that looks pretty favorable. So um, based upon that, um, this is something that should be offered and discussed with all, with all the patients. There's another interesting point in this article, which is that, that again, by their math, they said if the C-section rate were to ever get above 27 percent, then elective cesareans might actually be safer in that pregnancy than planned vaginal birth, because again, so many women would be suffering complications from the cesarean sections after labor, and that complication rate is higher than simply having an elective cesarean section, that above 27%, it might be more favorable f from the woman's perspective to simply be doing elective cesarean sections on everybody. And of course, we are above 27% right now. Now, after that paper, there, the, 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 if you look at the, the literature, the, the, the historic evolution from there is as follows. 
in the 1990s to 2004, again, the literature was trying to sort of get a, a handle on how much CDMR was actually occurring. But most of the literature was in favor of, 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 of showing a trend upward for CDMR during the 90s and early 2000s. FIGO, which is the um, International Federation of Gynecologists and Obstetricians, in their ethics statement in 1999, and my, by the way, this was a, a, a big document essentially about ethic, all sorts of ethical issues and uh, obstetrics, and there's exactly one paragraph on this, and I've quoted most of it. Okay, so it's, it's not like there was, there was a lot of um, argumentation here, but, there, but there, what they said was, at present, because hard evidence of net benefit does not exist, performing cesarean section for non-medical reasons is ethically not justified. So they took a purely sort of net benefit, beneficence-based argument and said, we can't, there's, there's not good evidence of a net benefit we should not be doing CDMR. This is more of a, of a world body. It does not so much representing the views um, of uh, American obstetricians. Five years later, um, you know, two very prominent OB um, ethicists, Howard Minkoff and Frank Shervenak, who spoke here a couple weeks ago, right, um, published in the New England Journal an opinion piece where they actually took the opposite view. They said, based on the fact that the risks and benefits of CDMR are actually relatively balanced, or at least we can't make a strong case that, that, that one option is, is, is safer or better than the other, that, we, that we, we feel that a maternal autonomy is sort of the most, most important principle here. Um, and that it's ethically permissible to accept a request for CDMR. Now, they also said, though, that because there was no net benefit, that this was not something we should be offering our patients, but that if a patient requested it, that, it, that in the presence of a, of, a, of a robust informed consent discussion, we could accept that, that request. Right? And actually the same year, ACOG, the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, in a, uh, a bulletin that, that had to do with surgical decision making, not with CDMR specifically, just surgical decision making, they essentially said the same thing about CDMR. They said, well, it looks like the risks are, and benefits are comparable as in a setting of good informed consent. We think that patient autonomy argues in favor of, of accepting requests for CDMR. Two years later, there was an NIH consensus panel convened about the question uh, regard of, of CDMR, and these are the conclusions of, the, uh, of, of their findings. They said, it does appear that CDMR is increasing. It's hard to get a good handle on it. They, you know, the, the upper limit number of 18 percent seems, seems really too high for me, but, but, um, but it is unclear exactly how often this is occurring. There's obviously never been a randomized controlled trial where we took pregnant women and said, you're going to get an elective cesarean section, you're going to ha have a trial of labor. So our evidence is all indirect regarding the, the safety and, and, um, and risks of this. They said in the discussions with patients that you should have individualized, essentially sort of a shared decision-making model where you look at the risks and benefits for, benefits for that patient specifically. They reaffirmed the idea that, that elective cesarean section should not be occurring below 39 weeks because then you would potentially be incurring additional risks uh, to the fetus in terms of iatrogenic prematurity. And then they, they said, well, but here's two, two cases where we don't think it's such a good idea. In case of maternal obesity, or in a case where there's an intended large family size. Though neither of those terms did they define. So, so at what, they didn't say at a, at a BMI of you know, 35, it's, it's no longer a good idea. They, they didn't, there, there was no quanti quantitation of what they meant by that. Or how big is a large family? So their conclusion statement was, after thorough discussion and review, cesarean delivery on maternal request may be a reasonable alternative to planned vaginal delivery. Sort of a neutral to essentially positive conclusion. ACOG followed a year later with now a committee opinion specifically on CDMR, opinion number 394. And they said, they essentially reviewed the data in the same way that the NIH did. So I'm going to go over, essentially, their findings were, 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 were essentially the, uh, lockstep with NIH. They said there are five outcome variables where we think the data is good enough to, to sort of render an opinion about the risks and benefits. In terms of maternal hemorrhage, um, that data actually surprisingly favors cesarean sections. So that, that there are, that 
there are actually worse hemorrhages associated with vaginal birth than with, than with elective cesarean sections. And so on the basis of maternal hemorrhage, that, that's an outcome variable that favors an elective cesarean section. Obviously, maternal length of stay favors a vaginal birth. Women stay one to two days in a hospital after a vaginal birth. It largely has to do with establishing breastfeeding and bonding and things like that. It's not, that it's not, it's, it's not, a, a, it's not as medically indicated as it is for a woman who stays three to four days post C-section because she's recovering from major abdominal surgery, right? Um, neonatal respiratory morbidity. Um, certainly the pediatricians in the audience re you know, recognize that uh, babies are much more likely to go to the NICU after a cesarean section than after a vaginal birth. And the primary reason that they go to the NICU is because they have wet lungs, right? TTN, transient tachypnea of the newborn. That in, a, in the process of a vaginal birth, a baby sort of gets squeezed dry and comes out you know, ready to breathe, where in a cesarean section they sort of get plucked from the pool and they come, they come out wet and maybe not ready yet to breathe, and they may, they may require more support, more, more oxygen, et cetera. Um, so let me define a couple terms here. So problems with the placenta in future pregnancies, and this is a, a topic we're going to talk about a lot more in, in this. In this. Um, that favors vaginal birth. So placenta previa is when the placenta um, implants too low in the uterus and is covering the cervix. And that can lead, it does lead often to prematurity, maternal hemorrhage, um, and sometimes hysterectomies. A placenta accreta is when the placenta, and this is often associated with the placenta previa, is when the placenta actually grows into the wall of the uterus and sometimes beyond the wall of the uterus. So in the case of a placenta percreta, the placenta can actually grow beyond the uterus into the vessels in, of the pelvis, into the bladder, um, in, into, the, in, into the bowel. All right? So a very, very, a very serious complication that requires significant um, sub, um, surgical subspecialty support. That almost never happens with after, uh, in subsequent pregnancies after a vaginal birth. It has increased significantly with cesarean sections, and I'm going to show you some data on that. Um, and then if you have a cesarean section, you have a scar in your uterus, and then with future pregnancies, there's the possibility of that scar opening up. If you, if you try to labor, that risk is about one to two per uh, per hundred, but there are cases of actual uterine rupture even prior to labor. So the uterine rupture is a potential complication with cesarean section in future pregnancies, even if you are, plan on having future, future cesarean sections. This table is from the ACOG um, committee opinion, and what I'm going to have you focus on is, is this. So you can see that once you have, once you're having more than one cesarean section, additional cesarean section, the risk of placenta accreta beca now becomes substantial. And you can see it increases dramatically with, with, with additional um, cesarean sections. The same is true for the risk of hysterectomy. They went on to say that, surprisingly, that, that they felt that, that these were, were four um, areas that, that they felt the data was either inconsistent or too weak to make a judgment, to pass judgment on or to make decisions regarding the viability of CDMR. So remember the paper from New England Journal the, in 1985 that actually argued that one of the reasons we should do elective cesarean sections was stillbirth. They said, well, no, because although in the index pregnancy, in, the, in that particular pregnancy, the risk of stillbirth goes down if you simply deliver the, the, the baby at 39 weeks, but in future pregnancies, stillbirth rates are actually increased by a prior cesarean section. So they essentially cancel each other out. All right. Um, pelvic organ prolapse, I think it's, it's, we consider it sort of common knowledge that cesarean sections re reduce pelvic organ prolapse. And that's true to some extent, but the number needed to treat, that is the number of cesarean sections you would need to do to, to, to prevent a single co case of pelvic organ prolapse that requires surgical intervention is so high that, it's not, it, that that's not a good argument for performing cesarean sections. Specifically, if you look at stress incontinence, right, so loss of, you know, involuntary loss of urine after, after a pregnancy, in the first year after a vaginal birth, women who have had a cesarean, cesarean section have less stress incontinence than a, vaginal, than a vaginal birth. But if you look at two years, there's actually no difference. So the, the, the 
the incidence of stress incontinence two years out from, from a birth is no different between a cesarean section and a, and a vaginal birth. Um, maternal mortality, again, I want to focus here that this is, this is in, in dealing with that specific pregnancy, the index pregnancy. There's no evidence that, 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 that there's a substantial difference in maternal mortality between an elective cesarean section and a trial of labor. Um, and, and somewhat surprising to me, at least, the, the thromboembolism what wasn't increased by, by a cesarean section because certainly we tend to think of, of uh, pelvic surgery as, as increasing thromboembolism, but they said the evidence wasn't strong for this. So um, the recommendations that, that uh, ACOG 394 made were they reaffirmed the 39-week rule. They said um, that the request for CDMR should not be based on an unavailability of effective pain management. Um, and this is a Hollywood representation of what that would look like. Um, that you know, if the issue is, is f fear that, uh, of inadequate uh, pain relief, that that should be dealt with in, at an institutional level, not by performing elective cesarean sections. And again, they said that it, it's not for women. Uh, they would not recommend it for women who desire several children again, without defining what that would be and, or where they think that cutoff should be. So the, the ACOG Committee Opinion 394 essentially took a neutral to permissive stance on CDMR, saying in, this, you know, in the setting of, in, of informed consent, um, with, with that adequate discussion of risks and benefits and shared decision making, it's, it, it, it's OK to go ahead with a, with a, with a, a CDMR request. Um, I want to break this down now, looking at the four uh, biomedical principles. I will say all my images um, came from Google, Google Images, and I found this one particularly striking because what I Googled was maternal autonomy, and what I got was a headless pregnant woman. All right, So I just thought that was worth pointing out. Um, so ta now, going back to autonomy for a moment. All right, so. Um, you know, what, what ACOG essentially said was, you know, we, we think that the privileging of maternal autonomy is appropriate in this circumstance, given that we don't have, a, you know, a, a, clear, uh, a clear risk or benefit reason, reason not, not to privilege autonomy. So that in the setting of informed choice, individual vi visualized recommendations can be made, and in the setting of shared decision making, it's okay. So the literature you know, has expressed a couple concerns regarding this, this, uh, this privileging of autonomy. One is, a, a, it's a paper that I, that I will talk uh, more about further, that interviewed women after they'd already made a decision in favor of CDMR. And in that qualitative study, actually none of the participants could name a long-term risk of CDMR after they had already signed their, their, their consent for CDMR. Um, the second concern that, that, that I have and that others, others have shared is that the United States, couples and women in the United States consistently underestimate our fecundity. That is, we have more children than we intended. We are the only developed country where that's true. And on average, we tend, we tend to have about one more child than we initially planned. I will say for myself, when I was a young man, it, you know, I would, if you had asked me, I would have said I want 1.2 children, one child and a small dog, right? And I have three, right? So I, in, in that sense, I'm a typical American, right? Um, and and um, so obviously, the estimated family size is an important factor in the safety of CDMR. And if we consistently underestimate our, our, our actual family versus intended family, that, that's a problem with our decision making. Staying on the topic of autonomy, there's sort of two views about how we should understand the decision making regarding CDMR. I think the, the, the view of NIH and the view, the view of ACOG is that a request for, ACOG, uh, for CDMR is essentially um, an assertion of a positive right of autonomy, that, that we have sort of a presumption toward vaginal birth. That's, the, that, you know, that's, that's sort of the evolutionary default, and that someone is requesting something different than the default, and therefore, um, you know, it, it, while, while a request could be acceded to if the risks are, are, you know, are commensurate, 
it's not something that you that you have to provide, right? Because it's a it's a positive right, which is obviously more circumscribed than than negative rights of autonomy. There's a counter argument, which which you can see in that very first paper from the New England Journal, where the, where where I think that they are implicitly making um, the opposite argument. They're essentially saying, no, there's really two ways to give birth, right? 70% of women, you know, deliver vaginally. About 30% of women deliver by cesarean section. They both have different risk profiles, and therefore it should be patient choice, more like analogous to uh, mastectomy versus lumpectomy and radiation. There, like there are two ways to to treat this, and women should be, should be offered both, both options, and they should be the ones making the decision, right? Under this model, the, where the difference is, is that if, if you accept this, then this is actually something that we should be offering to all of our patients. It's one of the two ways that uh, a woman could give birth, and so everyone essentially sh should have a conversation regarding the pros and cons of CDMR. I would say that's the minority position. The feminist bioethics literature um, has pushed back on, on, on CDMR saying, no, um, CDMR is not an expansion of maternal autonomy. That, that, that's that's a, a misconception uh, uh, of this whole debate. So Sylvia Burroughs in the American Journal of, of uh, Bioethics um, made the argument that, that first of all, for it to be an autonomous decision, it requires informed consent, right? We, that, that's, that's a given. And that there's so much lack of clarity regarding the real risks and benefits of CDMR that you can't really make an autonomous decision. As, you know, as both the NIH and ACOG said, there, the, the, the risks going both ways, um, a, 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 lot, a lot of the evidence is poor, a lot of the evidence is indirect, therefore this is not really a, 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 an autonomous decision. Furthermore, th that women have been socialized into um, essentially fearing childbirth and, and believing that, that, that there's a technological uh, what she calls a technological imperative, that you think about how childbirth in America happens, you go into a hospital, you get an IV, you're on a monitor, 80% of our patients get, it, get an epidural in labor. So it, the appearance is that, that, that birth is made safe by technology, and if that's the case, then obviously the, then the ultimately safe birth would be the most technological birth, which would be a cesarean section, right? So this technological imperative actually sort of coerces women into thinking that, that the cesarean section is, is, is the best option for, for birth. Moving on now to the second uh, principle of biomedical ethics, beneficence. What I would say about this is that there's a lot, that there, there's a lot of distortion regar regarding why women are actually choosing CDMR um, and the media is certainly not helping this. So in a, in a paper where um, Dr. Wax looked at uh, all, sort of all the, the studies about why women were choosing um, elective cesarean sections, the overwhelming reason is not what you might think. It's, um, it's not convenience, it's, it's, not, um, it's not the high-powered mom, it's actually fear of labor. And that most of these women were of a lower socioeconomic class, they had higher rates than average of depression and anxiety, and a lot of them actually had prior trauma. Some of them prior birth trauma, some of them prior traumatic experiences in their life. All right? Now, that, I, I want to step aside one moment and say I recognize that, that this is actually different than, um, than the rest of the world. So in a lot of the developing world, CDMR actually is sort of a, a upper class sort of phenomenon associated with the wealthy, but, but that, that actually appears not to be true in the United States. Then in this qualitative study that I referenced previously uh, from the Journal of Midwifery, where they interviewed women who were, who were going to have um, a, a CDMR birth, the, the way the women spoke, and again, this echoes what Sylvia Burroughs was, was talking about, was very much of, um, was one of, the, one of the women said, well, I've never, I've never given birth. I don't know anything about it. But the doctor's given, you know, the doctor has delivered thousands of babies, so I just want to turn, turn, it, all, turn it all over to him. And because and, he know, he's the expert, so I'm going to let him take care of this. Sort of a switching off, right? 
um, and and that that what they what they wanted was the baby. They had they had there was literally no privileging of sort of the birth experience or the birth as an event itself. So. Um, what I want to contrast this with is, is the popular conceptions about CDMR that, that, as I suggested, actually the literature has said are wrong, but I think this, this actually distorts the whole conversation regarding CDMR. So I just want to spend a moment talking about that. I also wanted to say that, that I'm probably, uh, I didn't understand the, the pun of this until, so uh, we did this uh, paper published in birth looking, doing a content analysis of of the media representations of CDMR. And I think, I think we put, in, in the first paragraph, we used that, that term too posh to push. And I actually didn't even understand it at the time that the, the paper was published. It had to be explained to me that that's a pun, right? Because this is Victoria Beckham, who her name as a Spice Girl was Posh Spice. All right. She had four elective cesarean sections, and hence the term too posh to push arose related, related to her choice to have uh, elective cesarean sections. But what, what, I, what I want to point out is that the, in, in popular media representations, the fear of labor, which as I said is the overall overwhelming driver of CDMR, is, is essentially completely ignored. All right, um, and instead, the, the the popular perception is is this too posh to push? Uh, that this is what this is what rich people do. This is what high powered people do. Um, also, in the popular media, the risks of a, of cesarean section are essentially never discussed. And the other thing that's never discussed is the fact that there's significant physician ambivalence around CDMR. Right. So, in surveys of obstetricians in America, at least between 43 to 48 percent of them actually will not perform. Um, a CDMR cesarean section. Um, and only 18% of them think that, 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 that there would be some circumstance where, where they, they would find it acceptable for themselves uh, or for their partner. So the, the perception in the popular media is that physicians are all, are, are all gung-ho about this and that, um, and that it's the, the, the rich and famous who are getting it. And I just, you know, that's actually not the reality. The justice issues are also um, muddier than you would think. So, uh, you know, my, my own view prior to looking at this was, well, obviously, from a distributive justice sense, sense it does not make sense to be performing an unindicated surgery, right? The, obviously, cesarean sections are much more expensive than a vaginal birth. In fact, they're about twice as expensive. But the problem is, is that we have, with, with a C-section rate of 30%, the most expensive patients are actually the ones who labor and then get a cesarean section, because then they had to take up all those resources, sometimes for more than a day on labor and delivery, and then still take up all the surgical resources. So our C-section rate being as high as it is actually makes the justice issue sort of a wash. Again, I w but that's true only for the index pregnancy, meaning that for that particular pregnancy. For future pregnancies, we know that repeat cesarean sections are obviously much more expensive than repeat vaginal births, and that for those more complicated uh, repeat pregnancies, the ones complicated by previas, accretas, et cetera, those are incredibly expensive um, births and, and incredibly complicated. So between 2007 and 2013, something shifted. And it's, this is what I find so interesting. So this is the, in, in 2013, ACOG um, disavowed the 394 committee opinion. In fact, it's, you, it's actually really hard to find because they take it off their website. You, you, um, they even take it off uh, previous editions of the Green Journal. It's act, it actually took some digging to find the exact wording of the original, of the original um, committee opinion and then issued this new committee opinion. What's in red are the changes between 394 and 559. So they added the word pre-labor and then they ended the abstract with this. Given the balance of risks and benefits, the Committee on Obstetric Practice believes that in the absence of maternal or fetal indications for cesarean delivery, a plan for vaginal delivery is safe and appropriate and should be recommended to patients. Well, 
it gets even more interesting than that, all right? Because there's no new references. The whole evidence section is a cut and paste from the previous committee opinion. There's no change. They use the, sa exact, the same citations, same references, same discussion of risks and benefits. So actually, they don't explain why they make the change anywhere in the, the new committee opinion. The pre-labor part is also sort of an interesting addition. It, when this committee opinion came out, we were actually in final revisions for, for our own paper from the Green Journal, where we had argued against CDMR in labor. And well, I'd love to flatter myself and think that that was because of, because of my paper, I think that they reached the same conclusions that, that we reached uh, independently, which is that, that informed consent in, in active labor, given the sort of wide-ranging discussion you're supposed to have with a woman uh, regarding CDMR, that it does, just doesn't seem practical that you're going, to, you're going to adequately do that with a woman in active labor, both with, with the time constraints and everything else. Um, and then the, the additional problem with, with, with why I think they added the word pre-labor is that, remember, it's, the risks and benefits are supposed to be balanced. But once a woman is actually in labor, performing a cesarean section at that point is actually riskier than a vaginal birth. And so, so it's reasonable at that point to say, well, actually, now this, this is no longer something that should be on the table because the risks of a cesarean section at this point in terms of infection and hemorrhage, et cetera, are higher. And, and, and so it, it's, it's really no longer a, a good option. But it's clear also that their wording has, despite the fact that they don't discuss any new evidence, uh, has shifted from a neutral position to one where they, they're actually favoring vaginal birth and recommending against CDMR. Now, Dr. Ecker is the next person to speak uh, in this series. And I think in, in this, in this uh, opinion piece published in JAMA right around the same time, he is giving the, the logic behind the change of the committee opinion. So he said, in this, Importantly, these evaluations, the NIH consensus statement, and I would argue the, ACOG, the earlier ACOG committee opinion, consider only the index pregnancy and not outcomes in future pregnancies in which a prior cesarean delivery may lead to increased, increased complication rates. I think that that, that, that is the, the explanation for this shift, that, that they realized that perhaps they had focused too much on only that pregnancy and not looked at the, and, and not looked at the long-term consequences of, of elective cesarean sections. This is a paper from the Green Journal to, published two years before the, the 2013 change that looked at, it's, it is an association, it's not, this is not implied causality, but, but, but what, what they found was that in 1998, the cesarean section rate was 21% and the maternal mortality was 10 per 100,000. By the, the year 2004, the cesarean section rate had climbed by eight points, and the maternal mortality rate, maternal mortality had also climbed. And they at least hypothesized that, that the increase in multiple cesarean sections, which we know is associated with significant complication rates um, and hysterectomy rates, uh, may, be, may be one of the drivers of the increase in maternal mortality. This paper from 2015 digs a little deeper on that question. So when, when, I, uh, when I was a resident in the early 1990s, I can count on one hand how many placenta accretas we took care of at University of Rochester, right? Um, and it was, I think, three in four years even though that's a, we had a very large catchment area. And I remember one of them distinctly because one of them was a patient who was delivered at a community hospital rather than being transferred to the university hospital. And she actually died on the table, right? So she was a maternal mortality related to a placenta accreta. And the, the obstetrician was, was roundly criticized for not transferring her to the tertiary care center. So I think that, that while these statistics are somewhat reassuring, the problem with this study from the Green Journal is that it was looking at the outcomes only from tertiary care centers, where, 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 where we have a lot of experience dealing with accretas. I will tell you that experience has increased dramatically. So now, in contrast to my experience as a resident, we deal with one to two placenta accretas per month at Albany Medical Center. We have an accreta team, right? 
And so, you know, we go from three and four years to one to two a month. But the cesarean section rate in the 1990s had just climbed to like 16%, right? And now we're looking, our cesarean section rate at, at Albany Medical Center is almost 40%. 40. Almost 40. We, all, we, we also have almost no low risk births. We are, we are, almost all of our, 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 of our births are, are, tra are trans high risk transfers. I say that to excuse us. Um, the, the, so this paper from the Green Journal um, said yes, the rates of, of placenta accreta are, are increasing. They recommended tertiary care delivery, but the problem is, is that you only identify about half of the accretas prior to, um, prior to the birth, which means that a lot of accretas are actually being delivered in community hospitals. And this paper actually doesn't address the outcomes in community hospitals. In fact, there has not been a paper addressing what the outcomes are uh, for accretas in, in community hospitals. And this may be a silent driver of increased maternal mortality. Um, this number is actually artificially low because a number of these abnormal placentas were only focal accretas. In the ones that were, were true accretas, the, the, uh, the average blood loss was over 3,000 cc's. Um, and the 70, you, you, can, you can tell this is artificially low because they have a 70% hysterectomy rate. In true accretas, the, the hysterectomy rate approaches 100%. The other number that I thought was a little bit low is one third, only one third being admitted to the ICU. We essentially admit all of our, our accreted uh, post-hysterectomy patients to the ICU, at least for the first, first night, because of this, usually the massive amount of fluids that they receive. So this, this paper from the Journal of Maternal Fetal Medicine um, argued that essentially that, that, that our increasing cesarean section rate, and particularly our elective cesarean section rate, is, is, is actually driving an increase in maternal mortality. And, and while, I'm sorry. Oh. While he acknowledges that, at least for the first cesarean section, it's not clear whether maternal mortality is actually increased or not, he said there's, the evidence is pretty compelling that with, with multiple repeat cesarean sections, there's a higher rate of maternal mortality. And, and that ACOG's position of taking a neutral permissive stance is, is actually going to have the effect, if it's not already having the effect, of increasing maternal mortality. And, and the other point he made is remember that the first cesarean section after an elective cesarean section isn't that much riskier than the original cesarean section. It's the next one and the next one where the risks really start mounting. So he said there's really about a six year lag before you're going to start seeing a significant increase in maternal mortality because of this. Marion McDornan, who is a CDC um, epidemiologist, published in the Green Journal just this year, actually just a couple months ago, um, a paper regarding the uncertainty um, involving maternal mortality. So I didn't know this, but apparently since 2007, the CDC statistics on maternal mortality have been unofficial. And the reason is, is because in 2007, there was a change in reporting the reporting um, requirements so that states were supposed to adopt um, some specific questions regarding maternal mortality on death certificates so that they could follow that. The problem is, is that uh, some states uh, adopted it right away, some states have yet to adopt it, and some states adopted it but modified it, and so our maternal mortality uh, reporting is now sort of a mess. And as she tried to, tried to dig down on it, what she said is, what, what is clear is that, I'm sorry, um, there is that there, there has been a real increase. Remember in the 1990s, the maternal mortality was 10 per 100,000. The best estimate right now is that it's close to 24 per 100,000, all right? Now, some of that may be better reporting, but she said it's clearly not all better reporting. Um, I'm, I will try not to comment on the fact that Texas's maternal mortality has doubled. And the, the quote from the paper where she said that, 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 that this appears to be real, not an artifact of reporting, and that the only time they've ever seen that kind of ch uh, change in, uh, in such a short period of time is in wartime. California, on the other hand, that, that has worked actually hard in terms of get, trying to get the state to um, uh, get, uh, 
propose um, hospital-based uh, initiatives to, to reduce, reduce maternal mortality has actually been very successful with, with um, uh, strategies at, at, at dealing with hemorrhage and preeclampsia. So it is possible to drive the, the maternal mortality rate down, but it, but it takes a concerted effort. The Sylvia Burrow uh, article that I mentioned earlier um, references something that I think a lot of obstetricians have also uh, re reflected on and thought about and even talked about, which is, does the mere presence of elective cesarean sections drive up the cesarean section rate more than just the elective cesarean sections? That is, that is, we've all sort of heard on labor and delivery the, the, it's like, well, you know, now we can do a C-section for any reason. This one's not going so well. Let's just throw in the towel. So the, the idea that, that uh, are we throwing in the towel earlier now that you don't really need an indication for a cesarean section? So is there a multiplier effect? That's on the physician side. And then on the patient side, si similarly, and this is what, what Sylvia Burroughs was, was addressing, is are, are women less and less confident in their own ability to, to give birth and therefore more and more willing to simply throw in the towel or even request a cesarean birth. You may notice that I actually changed um, the, the title from here to the one I gave today. I dropped the word maternal safety and just said safety. And the reason is, is because there's, there's some new evidence that, that, that um, I've only recently been, aware, been made aware of, it was actually a third year medical student that actually pointed me to this literature, um, about the potential consequences for the baby of elective cesarean sections. So um, ACOG just recently uh, init is issued a committee opinion where they acknowledged that cesarean, babies born by cesarean section actually have higher rates of asthma, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. And the presumed reason is actually differences in gut flora. And this is fascinating to me. This paper from, um, from the American Gut Project actually looked at the gut flora of adults born by cesarean section and by, and by vaginally, and their gut flora was still different. So if you were born by cesarean section, your gut flora was less diverse and closer to skin flora than to than, than the, sort of the, the enteric flora that, that you, would, you would expect. And elective cesarean sections may be worse than labored cesarean sections because if you've labored, most of the time your water has broken, and so the, the baby has been exposed to maternal flora through the vagina, whereas with an elective cesarean section, there's no exposure. This paper from JAMA Pediatrics, again, just two to three months ago, and this is the one the student showed me, um, is very intriguing. So a, pros a prospective cohort following 22,000 children from 1996 to the present. They were aware of the potential confounding factors, so they were very careful about trying, trying to um, adjust for, obviously, maternal BMI, gestational diabetes, et cetera. Um, but even after adjusting using uh, regression analysis, they found that cesarean birth was associated with a 15% higher rate of obesity in children compared to vaginal birth, and that if, if the birth appeared to be elective, that is, there was no indication for the cesarean section, then the number doubled. So again, suggesting that, that a, an elective cesarean section is, has actually potentially more harm than a, than a labored cesarean section. The 64% the increase, so what this is saying is if you look at a single family where you have three children, two born vaginally, one born by cesarean section, the one born by cesarean section is 64% more likely to be obese than its siblings. Right? Conversely, a child who is born by vaginal birth after cesarean being compared to their older sibling has a 31% reduction in obesity. So this is, you know, given the long-term health consequences of, of pediatric obesity, these are significant findings and, and should be uh, disturbing at least. So on the basis of the, the sort of the lack of clarity regarding maternal mortality and the, the issues surrounding uh, pediatric obesity, autoimmune disease, and asthma, 
what I'd like to conclude with is, is sort of saying, um, is this a case where we should be invoking a medical precautionary principle? So t taking this paper from the Journal of uh, Medicine and Philosophy, um, where, where he makes the case that, that, that it would be appropriate to take a precautionary principle um, to, to mitigate or prevent harms that are plausible and serious. The precautionary principle is the idea that, that you, don't need to, you don't need to have certainty in order to act. Okay? If you have a plausible risk that, that's real and, and, the, and the preventive measures are, are reasonable and not, and, and, and not uh, too draconian, that maybe we should, we should act before, we ha before the jury's completely settled on these, these issues. And I think this may be a case where, where our precautionary principle is, is appropriate. Um, so again, the plausible part being, it doesn't, you don't have to have it nailed down quantitatively if you see a potential risk that could, that could be responded to. I think in a, in a certain sort of way, this is what ACOG did when it shifted its reasoning between the two um, committee opinions, going from neutral to essentially recommending against CDMR. I think you could make the argument that essentially what they were doing was implicitly invoking this principle, right? Because obviously making a recommendation is, is proportional and, and physicians making recommendations to their patients is, is, a, is certainly a realistic strategy. I think there's no question, I hope there's, uh, that, that, I, that you believe at this point there's no question that there's some plausible risks associated with elective cesarean section both on the maternal side and on the side of the baby. The one concern I do have is whether this recommendation alone is actually sufficient to reduce the harms associated with CDMR. I mean, um, I, I, Julie, I don't know what your experience is, but my experience is that most obstetricians are actually unaware that ACOG has now taken a position s s sort of more negative on CDMR. I think most obstetricians still sort of view it as, yeah, I can do it if I want, and, 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 and ACOG doesn't really care. Um, and that's actually really not what the most recent committee opinion says. So conclusions would be, um, I think early on, the, the way the ethics was viewed was that at least for the index pregnancy, that the risks and benefits seemed uh, to be relatively balanced, um, and that that was what they initially made their decision on, right? Um, and that what changed was that they began to look more to, to the future once you've had a cesarean section. So CDMR probably does increase the maternal mortality with additional cesarean sections. I think the evidence is suggestive that the risk of harm is increased um, for children of cesarean sections. And I think uh, that ACOG's change, their, their recommendation now against CDMR is fully justified. Thank you. Yes, Mo, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Since uh, I'm an, an old obstetrician and I went through the ACOG 207 and 213, um, my question is actually about the patients that who are hypertensive, preeclamptics, and all these patients that end having cesarean section. Is there a is, is it the C-section that make the babies hypertensive down the road, or they inherited something from their parents? Is there a genetic factor in causing their hypertension, or just the action of cesarean section, which is just, it doesn't, um, for an old obstetrician, it's not convincing to me. This is number one. And I'll ask my next question after you answer. Well, I mean, we know that the first point that you made is is absolutely true. That that right. The children of preeclamptic moms um, do suffer from higher rates of hypertension. Actually, suffer from higher rates of obesity themselves. Right, um, and and that's that's all true. Although the 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 JAMA article actually. Um, was looking at specifically, uh, they, they were looking at elective cesarean sections. So if you had preeclampsia, you would have been eliminated from that, uh, 
from that pool. Although they, you know, they showed that for all cesarean sections, the, the rate of obesity, et cetera, was 15%, but that if you ha didn't have any indications, so that would eliminate those preeclamptic women, the, the rate of obesity actually doubled to 30%. So the answer is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. my, my second question. I'm, I'm not taking everybody's time. I have to leave. But my second question is the question of seeding of the, patient, of the baby's mouth yes, yes. with vaginal flora. I mean, this is took off, and then people, half of the people with it, and the others say that it's just uh, fade, and you should not subject these children for vaginal flora, that may cause problem for them in the future. We don't know. You take an infection and put it in the baby's mouth and you're hoping to get the vaginal flora to be... Yeah, I, I, so um, let me give a little background here. So the concern about uh, babies born by cesarean section not getting the maternal flora, one of the responses to that particularly, and this is more in the alternative communities, et cetera, is uh, essentially to, to propose that we should be doing something called vaginal seeding, which is if you have a cesarean section to take like a four by four swab and to swab the, the, the mother's vagina and then to sort of paint the baby with that to get so that the baby gets the flora from the vagina. In the mouth. Oh, the mouth. Hmm? In the mouth. Well, mouth, mouth and skin. I mean, they, you know, the different, there have been different proposals. Um, and ACOG, I think it was just two weeks ago, actually uh, came out against that saying, you know, while, while it's clear that, that, that it may be true that, that, that being exposed to the, to the maternal microbiome has benefits, we have no reason to know that this is, this is of any benefit and could certainly be, have some risk. It's not been studied, and people shouldn't just uh, sort of widespread uh, uh, you know, adopt this, this policy. I, and I, I certainly agree with that. Better. Hey, great talk. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Potter. Um, so, you know, there's a clear, I guess, correlation to be made for breast surgery and contra contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, right, where women have a breast cancer on one side, and before it was just BRCA carriers, but now people with high family risk or even just anxiety about having another breast cancer want a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And so we've seen, despite the fact that multiple physician groups have come out and published that there's increased risk with no oncologic benefit. More and more people sign up for it until just recently when insurance companies have said we're not paying for it. So you discussed the increased cost. Is there any discussion about who's paying for this and how that's going to affect this? So I think early on um, there were people that expected insurance companies to say we won't pay for elective cesarean sections. And they have not done that. And I, the, the argument that I have heard is that the fear that if you denied a woman an elective cesarean section and then she went on to have a stillbirth or a traumatic birth with HIE, that they would lose millions of dollars. So that they're, just, they're just not willing to deal with it. It's like, so at this moment, at least, there's not been any pushback from insurance companies. Yes, Julie. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for that really in-depth talk. Um, one point that I really wanted to explore was your uh, under the issues regarding autonomy um, and decision making at the time of labor, um, and the concern about counseling and consenting during labor. Um, and that being one of the reasons, perhaps, that ACOG chose to write pre-labor, um, kind of add that to the text. <coughs> Going down that road seems very dangerous to me. We do a lot of counseling and consenting during labor. Um, and I think that argument can be used um, also when we are talking about tubal ligation um, and, and, and can be used both to support counseling for sterilization or um, against counseling for sterilization. Um, 
can you just talk about kind of some of the parameters that you may have sure. with regards to those concerns about counseling at the t during labor? Because so we do it all the time for small things and large things. So when I, when I wrote that paper for the Green Journal, that's where I got pushback, uh, was on that very point. And what I, what I would say, because, because I want to be clear in it, you know, um, and I would say also that, uh, that my wife, who has a PhD in philosophy, actually really helped me write, the, write it in a more nuanced way to be clear that what I was not suggesting is that women somehow lose capacity during labor. Yes. Right? <laughs> that is concern. not the argument yeah. I am making. What the, the, arg the argument that I'm making would be in the same way that I, that I would n not think it a good idea to start a conversation with a woman in labor about whether she should at, then have a postpartum tubal in a few hours after labor, that that kind of elective decision making sort of doesn't belong in the moment of labor. labor. Not that a woman lacks the capacity to make a decision about medically indicated cesarean or not, uh, you know, or, or anything else than that, but that when you're talking about something that has far-ranging life consequences and that is purely elective, that the, the time to have that conversation is not labor, that, that the time to have that conversation is prior to labor. I, I, I hope you would agree that, that, you, that, that, would, that you would have some reservation about a woman at seven centimeters saying, and would you, would you please tie my tubes as soon as this is done, when it's the first time she's ever brought it up. Right, um, and and somehow we need to obviously be careful about not making statements that diminish a, a, a woman's decision making ability or capacity, while acknowledging that that labor may not be the time for a purely elective decision. That's what that's the yeah. line I'm trying to yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, I think that the argument that the risks change in labor to me is a much stronger argument, just because I, I do think that, um, like, as you said, I mean, that's a pretty, that statement or that, that line of argument can be really misused. Um, thank you. Thanks I, for, I recognize. Thanks for uh, expanding. <laughs> I recognize the, yeah. the, the fears that it invokes and yeah. that, you know, and the history of that, you know, that we have, that, you know, our profession has, has routinely denied women decision making uh, power and 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 um, and yet I still think there's a place for saying active labor is not the time for an elective for an elective decision like that and I think the only two the only two place the only two limitations I would give is is would be a postpartum tubal or an elective cesarean section I, I think those are the only w ones that I have reservations about let, let me ask you the question in the light of ACOG's change policy, and I thought I heard you say that many US OBs are not aware of the change. Has there been a national survey or even a local survey of what OBs are currently doing with regard to maternal requests? The, the only one that I know is that, is that it looks like so that 43% number is the most recent number of what, what percent of, of OBGYNs are willing to perform a CDMR uh, delivery on their patients. And that number, and that number um, are, are not willing, I'm sorry, are not willing. The, the, the older number was actually 48%. So it actually, if anything, it seems like more obstetricians are now willing to perform CDMR than used to be. So and if anything, by that logic, where the it doesn't it doesn't look like um, ACOG's uh, position has had a lot of effect. Does anybody know what we do here, yeah. Julie? It's not very common to do cesarean delivery. So I have a few colleagues in the background. Do you agree? Yeah. I know maybe one or two providers. Yes. Yeah. I know maybe one or two providers in an isolated situation. Yeah. That but it is not commonly done. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. Thank you, uh, Dan, and then Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, nice talk, Paul. It seems it seems like this is one of those cases where, as more facts come to light, the the sort of question of what's the ethical way to frame the decision making changes radically. Um, and if it, if it wasn't, if it was 
no change in sort of the health outcomes. My first question is, if there were no change in the health outcomes, would then it be ethical to, to sort of offer this procedure to every woman? Um, are there other sort of mitigating factors, like, I mean, the aesthetic factors or, or the, the goodness of naturalness, I don't know, that, that would lead you not to, to make this, you know, purely a choice of a, of a woman. And it seems to me, too, that as we, we're moving this age of increasing patient autonomy, that, that what is the level of risk that we then allow patients to make these kinds of decisions about their, their future? I actually like the way the statement is currently worded, which is not a blanket policy against CDMR, but more a recommendation against it, but still acknowledging that individual circumstances need to be accounted for. So um, a, 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 a book chapter that I just wrote, actually, now I'm going to con confuse the issue. Um, I wrote a, a book chapter sort of in favor of that women who have a, a a fetus with a, a fatal condition um, are one of the cases where it, it might be quite reasonable to perform an elective cesarean section. So we had a patient where we did an ethics consult on who had a baby with um, you know, a, a, a fatal anomaly that was going to die shortly after birth, but she was 41 years old, um, it was an IVF pregnancy, and it was her last embryo. And, and she said, I want to, and, and, and the, the MFMs said, well, the likelihood of this baby dying in labor is over 60%. And, and she, said, she said, I want to hold a living baby. And I know it's going to die, but I'm willing to go through a cesarean section to hold a living baby. And she's not going to have another pregnancy. And she's not going to have another pregnancy. Um, and... You know, I, I sort of walked over to that consult expecting to sort of uh, take the hard line, and I walked out writing a consult saying, go ahead and do the C-section. So I do think, I do think there's, there's a place for individualization of care here, and that, that I'm, I'm glad that, that we're, not, we're not taking a position simply blanket against uh, elective cesarean sections, that you have to look at the individual circumstances. Larry. That was, that was great. Um, the concept of the vaginal birth after C-section being accepted and the having a C-section is sort of elective. A lot of obstetrician will give a woman the choice to do either one. Where does that fit into this scenario? Is that the same? Well, so... I think, so if, if you think about the fact that, that tocophobia, fear of labor, is the reason that most women are choosing, are making a CDMR request. I think if they've had a cesarean section with that first pregnancy, it's extremely unlikely that that woman is then going to request um, a trial of labor after cesarean with, with the subsequent pregnancy. There was one, one piece of data that I, I find really interesting, and it was from that, the WAX paper that looked at sort of all the studies on, on why women were choosing CDMR. And it, it, it said that, that women who who actually didn't get a CDMR, who had tocophobia, and then went on to deliver, to labor and deliver vaginally, actually had much higher um, patient satisfaction and self-esteem than the women who got their cesarean section. Um, so, that, so that in a certain sort of way that by doing the cesarean section, you're essentially a f confirming their their fear rather rather than letting giving them the opportunity to overcome it. Yeah, but you, you have an increased risk of rupture, as you mentioned. No, yes, it's yes, a different but scenario. I, I'm, what I mean is that if yes, it, but I mean that if I, I think that if you once you've had a cesarean section and the first one was elective, I think it's extremely unlikely that you're going to choose no, something let's say different. The first one was not elective. Hmm? Let's say the first one was not elective. Okay. The second one now, you're given the option yes. to have an elective one with the increased risk of whatever small percentages of rupture. Right. Would that fit into the, your scenario there? 
or would it be a totally different? It's a, t it's a totally different s situation because it, uh, ACOG's position on that really hasn't changed, which is that once, once a woman has had a cesarean section, it's a whole different set of risks and benefits as, we, as, as you look at it. But, um, but the, the, that, that really is a, a case where um, you know, there's risk of, of uterine rupture if you, if you try to labor. Um, and if you have repeat cesarean sections, you have some of the risks that, that we talked about. And so, you know, ACOG's position is this, you know, this is a woman's choice and you, you give her all the information and you, you let her make that decision. What I will say is I've, I've heard now, again, just because, uh, you know, I, I talk to, to women who, who have more alternative sort of birthing uh, ideas and, and strategies that some of them who have had cesarean sections are now responding to this data by saying, um, I'm going to wait till I go into labor before I have my cesarean section so that the baby uh, potentially gets inoculated with, with the flora before, before I then have my repeat cesarean section. Yeah, I, I, I was, I mean, with the rise in the incidence of cesarean sections, as you say, your, your institution is now up to 40%. Uh, I, I have not been aware of these risks to the babies. Uh, are, are those risks only for elective cesareans, or do they apply also to cesareans after labor? They, they, so at least the, the, jam, the pediatric JAMA study su suggests that they apply to all babies born by C-section, but that, but that at least in the case of obesity, it's doubled if, if it was an elective cesarean section compared to an indicated one. So 15% versus 30. But still, I mean, even for the non-elective cesarean mm -hmm. section, the yes. the children are... The increase in childhood asthma um, is some... Were so, other people aware of that? I, yeah, you were. <laughs> you were too. Yeah. Uh, Is that right? I'm not saying they ask and other countries. Have they seen that as well? The question is whether other countries have seen this increase risk for the kids you know the, the 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 country that I wish had more data coming out of it was Brazil because Brazil is very interesting because the upper socioeconomic classes of Brazil have almost a hundred percent c-section rate oh, really? and the, and the lower socioeconomic classes have have much lower um, cesarean section rates and you know you would obviously expect the children of the of the, the upper class women to be much healthier, but are they experiencing higher rates of, of asthma and, and other problems compared to their, um, to their poorer uh, country people? I don't know, I don't know. But that there's not, I haven't seen any data coming, coming, coming out of you know, the country. A lot of Latin America has extremely high elective cesarean section rates in the affluent, in the affluent, affluent groups. And I wish we were studying that. Last question, because you've got the mic. <laughs> Has anybody looked at electively breaking the water and then doing a C-section? Not that I'm aware of. Oh. Well, that's what I, I'm not. I'm not so. Yeah, I mean, there's so a lot but of if women. If you can. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So if if if. You know, a 39-week uh, uh, scheduled C-section, a lot of times the woman's cervix is still completely closed. You couldn't do it. Well, join me, please, in thanking Paul.